church, we stand to worship our Lord in spirit and in truth. Looking to Him is all powerful, almighty, and strong. Church, you can go ahead and take a seat. Good morning, Christ Church. Welcome and Happy New Year. My name is Josh, and I get to be the small groups minister on staff. And hey, if you're new with us, we would love to meet you, to introduce ourselves to you, and to get to know a little bit about you, give you a gift out in our welcome center in the lobby after the service. And whether you're new here or you've been attending Christ Church for a while, you'll frequently hear that it is our purpose, that our purpose at Christ Church is for each person to experience completeness in Jesus. And one of the primary ways that we do this is through our classes and our groups. 
With a new year comes new opportunities for us to grow deeper in our faith in Jesus. And so on the screen, you'll see some of the classes that we're offering along with their start dates. And what I would like to highlight today is Rooted. If you're unfamiliar with Rooted, Rooted is an 11-week small group experience in which you'll explore the Bible, engage in experiences, you'll share stories, and you'll practice the rhythms that are essential to a healthy spiritual life. Because we all need community, we were not made to go through this life alone. And so if you do not have a community in which you are bearing with one another in love, encouraging each other to become more like Jesus, I would encourage you to consider registering for Rooted. Now, if you are considering registering for Rooted, there's probably four questions that are going to come to your mind. Cost, when, where, and child care. Rooted is $50 a person, and that covers your book, along with some supplies. It'll launch January 21st. And you have the option to join a group that meets on Sunday nights from 5 to 7 or Thursday nights from 6 to 8. Throughout Rooted, we will meet at the church and child care is provided for infants to fourth grade. Registration is going to close January 17th, so please sign up as soon as possible. And if you have any questions or you'd like further clarification, feel free to contact me. My email is on the screen. We're about to enter into our time of worship, and before we do, I would just like for us to take a minute to slow down. We live in an anxious age, don't we? We live in an age full of anxiety, and we probably experience this throughout the week where we're constantly being stimulated by our screens or conversations, um, just division in general. And it's in the midst of this anxiety that we often hope that things will get better. You may hope that you get that promotion you've been working for, or you may hope that your car limps along the rest of the year until you can afford a new one. When we have hopes like these, we're often wanting, desiring, the fu- whatever the future brings, that that will be better than our present anxiety. But I would like us to remember that we do not hope like the world hopes, for we have a living hope. We do not have a hope of an uncertain future, but we have a hope that is certain. We have a hope that is fixed in the past, active in the present, and secured in the future. We have a hope, a living hope, that is rooted in the death and resurrection of Jesus. And it is because of this living hope that we come and we worship him. So would you stand and worship with us? And as you do, would you just take a deep breath and rest in the peace that this living hope brings us. Let's stand. How great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain i could not climb in desperation i turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows finished the end is written Jesus Christ my living hope who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the God of has spoken, I am forgiven, as the King of kings calls me his beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Sing hallelujah, 
clear picture of who you are, King Jesus. We are thankful, filled with gratitude today.
I have recently been reading a book titled The Wager, a tale of shipwreck, mutiny, and murder. And as the subtitle accurately implies, this is a true tale about shipwreck, mutiny, and murder. And as I'm reading this, throughout the entire journey that these seamen are on, they are constantly being faced with dehydration, starvation, and their bodies are in a state of decay. And so while I'm reading this, it hit me. I have never physically been in any situation like that. I've never had to worry about access to food, clean drinking water, 
and I've never experienced illness to the extent that these men had. And while I haven't experienced this physically, I've certainly experienced this state spiritually. And I can say that at least at some point in time, you probably have too. We have all, uh, at one point in time, experienced a state of our souls being in dehydration, starvation, or decay. We have all been darkened in our understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that was in us due to our hardness of heart. We have all been corrupt through our deceitful desires, enslaved to the passions of the flesh. But Jesus, knowing the state that we were in, was born in the likeness of men with the intent of rescuing us and offering us forgiveness. Jesus, knowing the only way to cure our souls, bore the cross. And in John chapter 19, we hear Jesus' last two statements on the cross. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scriptures, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge to his mouth, full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The last two things that Jesus says on the cross are, I thirst and it is finished. Jesus thirsted physically as as we see him receiving the sour wine. But I think he also thirsted spiritually. If you think back to the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is praying to his father and he's saying, if there is any other way that we can accomplish this, would you please take this cup from me? Nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours. Jesus, took, t- bearing the cross, drank from the cup of divine wrath that we deserved. Jesus offered us nourishment for our malnourished souls. But he also says it is finished. On the cross, Jesus accomplishes the requirements of the law, fulfilling the scriptures. The powers that we were powerless against had been dismantled. And the perpetual state of decay that our bodies were bound, that our souls were bound to, had been broken. The liberation that we could not achieve was achieved for us. And so as we pass these cups, as we approach this time called the table, you'll receive Two cups, um, one, the top will have grape juice and the bottom will have a piece of bread. And as we partake of these elements, we acknowledge our complete reliance on Jesus to provide for all of our needs. We remember the work that he accomplished on the cross and we celebrate the new life that we have received in him. Would you pray with me? Holy God, we are so thankful for the work of Jesus that we have a new hope uh, in you, a hope of a new life. God, I pray that um, this time as we take these elements, that we would recognize our identity in you as a freed people. We are so thankful for your son. And it's in his name we pray, amen. When I think about generosity, I've recently been thinking about Hebrews 11, also known as the Hall of Faith. You may be familiar with this section of scripture where the author of Hebrews lists people throughout the Old Testament who have been faithful to God, often sacrificing a great deal in order to pursue God. And so the author of Hebrews talks about Abel, who gave a greater sacrifice than his brother, and because of this, his brother murdered him. He talks about Abraham, who left his country, his people, and his father's household to pursue a land, a city that God had built. And when he talks about Moses, who did not consider the temporary pleasures of sin or the wealth of Egypt to be greater than the wealth of Christ. And throughout this chapter, the author of Hebrews continues to talk about all of these people throughout the Old Testament who have been faithful to God and sacrificed in pursuit of him. And this continues on through the New Testament, and we know that this continues on today because we have all been affected by people who have been faithful to God and have sacrificed for him. And so when we come to this time of generosity, we don't give out of obligation. 
We give because we know the transformation that the gospel brings. We give because we know the effect that the gospel has on our lives. What it can do for an individual, a family, a society, nation, what it can do for the world. When we give, we do this because it provides another opportunity for somebody to hear the gospel, to join the family of faith that extends far beyond us. Would you pray with me? Holy Father, you have been so good and generous to us. God, we are grateful uh, for the opportunities that you have given us to serve you. God, I pray that we would be continue to be faithful um, and that we would um, do all that we can to bring glory to your name. We love you, and it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, church. It's good to see you this morning. We weren't sure if you'd all be standing in line at Walmart to buy bread and milk today with the great blizzard coming on Tuesday. So thank you for loving Jesus and trusting him. Uh, we are glad you're here. I need you to open your Bibles to Mark chapter 1, uh, please. Mark chapter 1. And uh, while you're doing that and giving your generosity uh, this morning, a couple of things we want to let you be aware of. If you're new to Christ Church, uh, two years ago in the spring leading up to Easter, we did a series through the Gospel of Luke. And last year we did a series through the Gospel of Matthew. This year we're going to be beginning to this morning in the Gospel of Mark. And there are some journals that we provide for you at just our cost. They're, they're simply $5, but it's a Bible journal that has the biblical text on one side and journaling note or pages on the other other side. And in fact, this will be the only time I'll ever give you permission to walk out on me in a sermon. You could actually go right out those back doors and there are two tables just outside the doors where they're, they're selling those. If you want to go pick one of those up, you're welcome to go do that. If you want to join us in journaling through this series with us and having the biblical text, it easy fits in your pocket, fits in your, uh, your purse, whatever you have, your backpack, it would be available to you. So I encourage you to have those. The second thing I want to let you be aware of that's available to you is our creative arts team, those that lead us in worship each and every week and help arrange things like Advent and Christmas Eve service and all the fun stuff we get to do throughout the weeks. They have written music over the past few years to attune to the series we're doing and the concepts we're uh, equipping. And you may not know that they're original songs to our church. Well, they've put together an album that's available in all streaming platforms. You just look up Christ Church Creative and uh, the brand new album was released last week. I've been listening to it all week long. It's fantastic. Songs you'll recognize that we sing here at church uh, that you could share with friends and let them know about it. And if you don't, if you don't have a streaming device, if you're, if you're not on Spotify or Apple Music, go find a fourth grader and ask them to take your phone. <laughs> And in two clicks, you will be streaming with the rest of the world. So uh, we really want you to enjoy that and use that in your personal worship and, and time with the Lord during the week and, and encourage our creative arts team as well. So I wanted to make you aware of that. We are starting our series this morning called The One, and we're focusing on Jesus, and we will all the way through Easter. And it's a pleasure to be able to just spend some time letting the scripture tell us who he was, uh, who we are because of that, and what he did for us. I want to begin in Mark chapter 1, verse 1, the very first verse. This is Mark's depiction. Now, Mark is probably the first gospel written. Uh, you know, Matthew is first in your New Testament, but most scholarship is pretty consistent that Mark was probably the first uh, story of Jesus recorded that we have written down uh, by one of the followers of Jesus. And he begins his story this way. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Now, there's two key concepts I want to point out from this very first. I'm not going to beat it to death, but you need to understand Mark's intention is to show us that he is the Messiah. What that means, he's the anointed one of God, the one promised to Adam and Eve back in Genesis chapter three, that God was sending Jesus to take care of what they destroyed with their sin and we destroyed with ours. So the Messiah is a big word and the son of God is the second piece we focus on. That not only was he the one sent, but he was God's son who came as God and man. And we just finished a series in December, if you weren't with us, on the incarnation and why it mattered that he came as fully God and fully man and not half God and half man. And so Mark is wanting to show us, I'm going to tell you about this man who came as the promised one, but also came as God here on earth. And so we're going to focus on the fact that Jesus is the one. Now this morning, I'm going to just focus particularly on verses 9 through 13, five very simple verses. And if, if I may, let me suggest to you this morning that if you rank the top 30 moments in Jesus' ministry, this one probably isn't one of them. 
And it's not because you think it's, it's worthless. It just doesn't seem as significant as some other events. But I actually want to start our series this morning by focusing on these because it tells us something about the character of Jesus. And it also gives us an impetus to live underneath who he is as the one. Our church here, we, we talk about it regularly. We believe that our church exists and what we try to do in programming and in one-on-one -on -one conversations is help people find their completeness in Jesus. And this series will focus on why we would do that, who he is and why that matters. So let's read verses nine through 13. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. At once the spirit sent him out into the wilderness and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals and the angels attended him. So Mark records, Mark gets right after it. This is actually the second appearance of Jesus in the scriptures outside of his birth. So you have when he was 12 years old and he stayed behind in the temple to talk with the religious leaders, to challenge them and to, to bait them. And here this 12 year old, this little junior high guy was having this conversation with these educated rabbis. And that's, then there's an 18 year silence between that moment recorded in Jesus' life and this moment of the inauguration, if you will, of his ministry, his first public appearance as an adult. And in that 18 years, there's not much said except in the Gospel of Luke, Luke records, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. What we learn there is Jesus grew up like the rest of us. He had to go through puberty. His face broke out. He got that little cheesy 13-year-old boy mustache that we all ended up with for a season. Uh, he, he got tall and lanky and he grew. His voice changed. He, he was just a human being walking among us having surrendered all the privileges of being God to walk with us. He remained God, but he humbled himself to be with us. And he lived like everyone else. But not only did he grow up like the rest of us did, but he grew in wisdom. Jesus took the teachings of the scriptures and the understanding of what God was doing, and he honored that. And he not only was, grew up normally, but he grew up in such a way that men and God himself were pleased with him. He, he, he was a good person. He was someone you would want to know. He was personable and, and he grew like everybody else. And then there's, that's all we learn about him for an 18 year period of, of his life until this moment that he appears. Now, we're gonna be using a glimpse into Matthew and Luke because Matthew, Mark, and Luke write specifically and intentionally in the same direction. The Gospel of John is a little bit unique and next spring when we cover it, we'll show you the uniqueness of that. But the, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we can intersperse their telling of the story because Mark gives very few details. He just simply says, Jesus showed up to be baptized by John, and he was. But we learn more in other passages of scripture. So what we're gonna learn is that there's something significant about the baptism of Jesus, and it's not like our baptism. Well, what we learn in this passage is that Jesus was the surrendered one. First thing I want you to think with me through this morning that Jesus surrendered himself. This was his first public act. He could have come in power and might. He could have come with military force. He could have performed a miracle right out of the gate to have everybody go, whoa, this guy's not like us. But he doesn't. The first thing Jesus does to inaugurate his ministry in the world is surrender himself. Let's read verse nine again. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. He comes to be baptized. Now, John, John the Baptist, as you would know him, John baptized for the remission of sins with the promise of the coming kingdom. So John said, repent and, be, and repent of your sins and be cleansed of your sins for the new kingdom that's coming. And Jesus comes to John and Matthew records that when, when Jesus approached John, John said, no, no, I can't baptize you. You don't need to be baptized. You need to baptize me. And in Matthew chapter three, Jesus responds, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Now, I don't want you to gloss over that statement. John says, you don't need to be baptized, and John was correct. John was baptizing for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus had never sinned. Jesus would not sin. And so why would he be baptized? So John's objection to Jesus makes sense. You don't need to be baptized. And Jesus didn't do symbolic things to be symbolic. 
And Jesus said, no, no, let it be so now. This is the moment I've come for. I am beginning my ministry. And in a beautiful way, he says to John, I'm gonna fulfill all righteousness, but he's not a sinner. So what is he trying to recover? He's not, he's actually demonstrating to us this. He was willing to have a relationship with God where he would do anything God asked him to do. Anything and everything, without hesitation. So he says to John, no, God's asked me to do this and so I am going to do it, to fulfill all righteousness. Well, why if he didn't need to be forgiven, would he be baptized? I read a story and I, I think it's true. There was a grandfather who drove by his daughter's house and he was in the neighborhood so he thought he'd pop in and see the kids and see his daughter and he went in the, the front and opened the door and nobody was there except he looked over in the living area in the playpen was his two-year-old grandson. And his grandson said, Papa, and held his arms up. And so he went over and he got him out of the playpen and he set him on the ground and they were playing with the little toys on the ground. And a few minutes later, his daughter came in, the mom walked in and she said, Dad, he was in the playpen because he's been naughty. He's being punished. You have to put him back. And the, the grandfather was horrified because when, you're, when you see your grandkid, the last thing you want to do is leave him in, you know, penitentiary. So he... <laughs> So he's looking at his daughter and, and, his, and his grandson's holding on to him saying, no, no, no. And he doesn't know what to do. And so the, the, the mom's miffed and she goes back in the kitchen for a few minutes. And she said she comes out a couple minutes later wondering if her dad did what she asked him to do. And said she looked in the playpen and her father was sitting with her son in the playpen playing. And that's a good grandpa right there. Because he didn't, he didn't uh, disobey her, did he? No, if he's going to play with his son, he had to play with his son in the timeout. Well, you know where I'm going. I'm a corny preacher, so this works easy. Why, why did Jesus get baptized? To relate to us. Not because he needed to learn to relate to us so that we could understand the heart of how he related to us. He entered into our condition. He entered into our circumstances. He went with us in our punishment so we would understand the goodness of why he came. To fulfill all righteousness was not because Jesus needed it. You see, Jesus did not get baptized to accept the promise of the promised one. Jesus went into baptism to show us he was the promised one and what kind of one he is. You see it? He actually demonstrates to us that the righteousness of God was worth everything to him and he would do anything God asked him to do and he entered into our condition and our world and he was baptized and it was a beautiful moment because his baptism, this concept of being immersed of being placed into the water is not only a washing symbolism, but it's actually a burial symbolism. And Jesus was willing to say, I will do whatever it takes to accomplish the righteousness of God for you all. So he entered into it with us, into our punishment. He entered into it with us. This is why when we hear Jesus say, I did not come to judge the world, I came to seek and save the lost, we can believe him. Because the way he surrendered to the righteousness of God provided a pathway for our righteousness. This is why he's the one. And then the second element is he's the surrendered one, but he's also the spirit-led one. And I want to show you something here because I think it's almost chronological, if you will. It's progressive. Let's read verse 10. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. So he surrenders to the, righteousness, the righteous plan of God, and he gets baptized, and as he's coming up out of the water, totally immersed into the water, as he comes up out of the water, he notices that the heavens have opened and entered the earth. Now, N.T. Wright, Dr. Wright says in his treatment of this passage, that we should not see like there was a little tiny window, like a little bubble opened, and the Holy Spirit came through, and then it closed up really quick. Like it was a time warp kind of deal. He says, Wright says, no, we can't see it that way. What we need to understand is when Jesus looked and he saw heaven entering into the world in the Holy Spirit, he knew that the kingdom he had promised to bring had begun. He said to all of us in that moment, no, no, all the division between the heavens and the earth are now changed because I am here with you and God's Holy Spirit is ruling again in his place. Pretty powerful picture when you think about it. And then it says, and the spirit descended on him like a dove. 
Now, it doesn't say the spirit was a dove. It came in the form of a dove. And that would have made a difference to his audience that day because a dove in Jesus' day symbolized two things. First of all, it symbolized a sacrifice. Now, when a firstborn, so any of you, your firstborn child, according to scripture, and rightfully so, belongs to God. The gift of life is a gift. And to honor God, a sacrifice was given back to God, not to keep the kid, but to acknowledge to God that you're grateful for the gift of this life. Now, I would always tease my oldest brother. I'm one of four. The oldest, I always think you firstborn sometimes think you're God, but you've misunderstood. You belong to God. And so the rest of us are trying to prove that to you the rest of your lives, right, as brothers. So they would go and give a sacrifice. So when Jesus was born, Joseph and Mary went to the temple to give a gratitude sacrifice back to God. And the minimum you could give was two doves. It didn't cost very much, but you made the effort. And Joseph and Mary were poor. They had very little, if anything. And so they gave two doves to God as a sacrifice for the firstborn son. And in that moment, that sacrifice would have meant something to them. And also the imagery of a dove throughout scripture is about peace. And it says that the, the spirit came down in the form of a dove and descended on him. Actually, you could interpret this also to mean it hovered over him. It flittered over the top of him. You, you might also see pictures in the book of Acts of tongues of fire over and above those that were anointed in the Holy Spirit. You also might recall back in the book of Genesis that it says that the spirit hovered over the earth. It fluttered. You see, biblical people understand that this is more than symbolism. This is a statement. On the day that Jesus inaugurated his ministry and came to announce to the world, I am submitting to my father to save you, the Holy Spirit came down to lead him. If you were with us in December in our incarnation series, one of the things I tried to remind you regularly is that Jesus did not come to earth to understand us. He came to earth so we could understand him. And his presence was that he gave up the privileges of being God to walk here limited by earthly body. So how did he accomplish everything? Because the Holy Spirit led him. Now let me put the two pieces of the puzzle together to see if you see what I see. Here's what I want to suggest to you and me. Until we are surrendered to God's plan, we cannot be led by the Holy Spirit. I think it's progressive what we learn here. In the surrender to the baptism, the Spirit came down to anoint Jesus and God said, I'm going to lead you by my Spirit because you have surrendered yourself to me. And I suggest for every single one of us, if the voice of God is quiet, if the presence of God seems distant, it may be because we are not surrendered. God will not lead someone who will not be led. He will give us up to our own devices, our own ambitions, our own wishes. The worst thing sometimes God can do for us is to give us what we want. And so Jesus in his surrender was spirit led. What a picture of the heavens opening, it all becoming available. And Jesus would preach regularly that the kingdom of heaven is available now. In fact, we shouldn't be surprised at this. The Old Testament prophet Isaiah tells us is exactly what God would do with Jesus. In Isaiah 42, here is my servant whom I am uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. I love it that it said, I will uphold him. Jesus surrendered to the spirit's leading. This is why on the night Jesus was betrayed, he could say to the world, I have only done what the father has asked and given me to do. I have been led by him. He's accomplishing through me everything he needs to do. Also in Isaiah chapter 11, you'll be familiar with this text, I'm sure. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. I've been told that that word rest means hover. Interesting imagery again. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. The spirit will lead Jesus to find his pleasure in the pleasure of God. He will judge not by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. 
He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness, the sash around his waist. Sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? And where does this all come from? Because he surrendered to God, the spirit led him to bring about everything in a way different than we would have imagined. You see, the spirit of God anointed Jesus for a life of self-sacrifice and led him on a path of suffering so that our suffering would be ended and his joy would be ours. He came in a power the world doesn't understand, but it's beautiful. These five verses that would not make the top 30 list of events in Jesus' life actually tell us as much about him as we'll ever need to know. He surrendered, he was spirit-led, and then this morning, he was a significant one. Because of this, he could be what we needed him to be. Because of this, he could accomplish what we needed him to accomplish. Verse 11, a voice came from heaven, you are my son, whom I love, with you I am well pleased. It's interesting. This is the third event that takes place in these very quick, brief five verses. That Jesus submits to the Father as asked. The Spirit anoints him and empowers him as promised. And God speaks a blessing. Now, looking out at a room this size, I'm just gonna assume every single one of us has had a moment that someone spoke words over us that we can't forget for all the wrong reasons. Somebody told us we were worthless. Somebody told us we wouldn't amount to much. Somebody told us we were a failure. And we try to erase those, but we hear them too often. We believe them too often and we're stuck by them. And maybe some of those harsh words were true and altered the path of our life because it awakened us. But I also pray that every single one of us has had a moment where somebody believed in us before we could believe in ourselves. Somebody spoke a word that has become such an encouragement, such an edification and belief that we've gone. What do you think it meant to Jesus? On the day he entered into this, not blindly, he knew what the scriptures forecast. He knew what awaited him at the timing of God. What do you think it meant to Jesus in that moment When the word of God spoke, you are my son whom I love, whom I'm well pleased. It was a public announcement. It's it's not the only time God would do this. On the Mount of Transfiguration, on on that moment that it was all culminating together and Jesus was honored on the mountain with the presence of Elijah and Moses, the law and prophets gathered together and the disciples there, John, James, and Peter were right there and they realized what was going on and they fell to their knees and began to worship. And Peter being Peter says, hey, let's build an amusement park right here. And Jesus is like, stop. And in that moment, that powerful moment, the voice of God spoke the same words with a small addition. This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And then God said, listen to him. The significant one. The one whose voice now matters above every other voice. The one whose life now matters more than even our own. God spoke the approval. This is the one I love. This is my pleasure. To be surrendered and spirit led brings God pleasure. It brings purpose. Peter, the same one who heard the, those words on the Mount of Transfiguration, would say in 2 Peter 1.17, it won't appear on the screen, but if you're taking notes, I'd encourage you to write this down and look at it. 2 Peter 1, verse 17, Peter tells us that Jesus received honor and glory from God when he heard those words. It meant something to him. The affirmation that this is what I've called you to and I'm going to accomplish through you what I promised to accomplish. But please also don't miss what verses 12 and 13 tell us. To be spirit-led, to be surrendered, to be significant in the kingdom of God, the spirit will lead us where the spirit needs to lead us, not where we want him to. And the spirit led him into the wilderness for 40 days. And he would be tempted 40 days without food or water, he would be tempted with hunger and praise and shortcuts. Satan is always offering you and I shortcuts. It's not quite what God wants, but it'll sure make your life easier. And every one of those by definition are sin. And in that moment, Jesus is led by the Holy Spirit. God's not cruel. 
But God led him to a life that was hard, that required suffering for the sins of the world, and Jesus willingly went. And he, as one scholar said, he actually is living out the life of Israel, but he gets it right. He's led out of Egypt, across the Red Sea slash Jordan River, into the wilderness, not for 40 years, but for 40 days, so that he can deliver his people to the promised land. This tells us so much about who Jesus is, how his submission allowed him to be led and about how his leading led him to significance. You see, it's pretty significant here when we see that as we begin our series that Jesus chose from the very beginning of his earthly ministry to demonstrate what it means to be God's. And by being God's, he becomes ours. He becomes the one, the significant one. So how do you and I, as everyday people, orient our lives around this man? Because if you hear me asking for anything less, it's misunderstanding. It would be as if I were a coach saying, oh, you want to play ball? Sure, just show up when you feel like it and give me whatever you got that day. That's not going to make you good at anything. It takes dedication, it takes practice, it takes the discipline of stepping in and doing the hard things every day when no one's looking. It actually demonstrates whether this matters. So how can you and I orient our lives around this man in such a way that his being the one is not just something we talk about, it's the way we build our lives. For some of you, this Christianity thing, you're not sure and it's okay, we're glad you're here. We were all there once. Every believer in this room was at a moment where we thought for ourselves, all right, I need to figure out this is real. When I have conversations with people in coffee shops, it always sounds something like this. I've tried it my way and it's not working, so what do you got for me? Well, let me introduce you to Jesus. Because when you orient your life around him, your self-satisfaction goes away and your self-trials go away. And all of a sudden you have something you can believe in and trust. So for those of you that are just kicking the tires on this, I wanna give you something very simple to do. Read the book of Mark each week for the next 12 weeks through this series. Start there. It's 16 chapters. Took me about 25 minutes to read it through the other night just to test drive this thing. If you read four chapters a day, Monday through Thursday, you could take Friday and Saturday as the Sabbath. Look at you. (laughs) And by the end of this 12 weeks, you'll know the gospel of Mark better than I do. And the best part is you'll know Jesus. You'll know who he is. You'll know why you can trust him. So I want to encourage those of you just starting, can you do that? Can you give 20 minutes, 10 minutes a day to read four chapters and read it through every week as a discipline? For those of you that are growing with Jesus, you're a follower, you've been forgiven of your sins and you're calling him your Lord and Savior, then I want to encourage you. Understand that wherever the spirit leads you when you surrender is where you need to be. Don't fight it. I hope this isn't too harsh. I haven't never done this before. The elders will fire me and I'll see you in heaven, okay? I'm telling some of you, what you really need to do is embrace the suck. You need to embrace the hard. We can't can't quit and run away every time it gets hard. We have to trust that the God of goodness will also be good to us in the harsh. So stay, don't quit. When the temptation comes, fight the temptation. Don't give in because it's hard. I'm not suggesting anyone in here is weak, but we all can grow. And if you want to grow with Christ, you have to stay with Christ, stay in him, not separate. He's not a genie in a bottle. He wants to guide the surrendered to where he's taking us ultimately to be with him. For those of you that are close and Christ-centered, then I just want to encourage you, keep going and help others around you. Don't be independent. Continue to worship and celebrate and go deeper. Keep surrendering the areas of your life that are hard to surrender and keep celebrating the joys of even the suffering that we will endure for the sake of the kingdom. You see, Jesus taught us a whole lot about who he was in these very simple opening moments of his public ministry. And he's the one that we center our lives around that we find our completeness in. So maybe today you have questions. Maybe you're going through a hard time right now that's tough to embrace. Don't do that alone. The back of the room are two tables with lamps lit. People are heading back there right now to pray with you, to encourage you, to answer questions. Maybe we can connect you with a Christian counselor or talk to a pastor who, who might walk with you through this journey. You're not in this alone, so don't stay in it alone. 
if we can pray with you, encourage you, or maybe God is laying someone on your heart right now that you want to know this Jesus, then go back there and let us pray with you about them. Let us ask God to do what he wants more than we do, to make a connection with their soul that he might show them why Jesus came for them and love them for them. Anything we can do to encourage you, the table's in the back or the prayer center out in the foyer, we invite you to open yourself up to this church community and we'll journey with you. Let's stand together.
with more of you, you just of me, take everything, yes, all of you is all I need, take everything. Amen. Church, what a powerful thing to pray. What a dangerous thing to pray. Lord God of the universe, would it transform us and conform us to make us more into his image. That is our hope. That is our desire, that we would look more and more like the significant one who would give up everything to rescue and redeem us. There's a prayer that I pray over my um, kids every night, and I just want to pray it over us as we um, get ready to leave. Father, I pray that we would be a people that would know you, that we'd be a people that would follow you, and that we would be a people that would love you. It's your name we pray through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Church, you are dismissed.